I think for people to be good eaters means you have to know what's going onto your plate, right? I mean, it's, it's so easy in our day of convenience to just have food ordered, you know, and delivered to your, to your uh, doorstep or go out to eat. But when you are involved in the process, you are intrinsically um, invested. You know what I mean? You're invested in the, in the quality of the ingredients, the, the smell, the, the taste, the preparation. And I think you end up having much more gratitude for your food and that gratitude that you have not only is absorbed by your body, it's also conveyed to the people that eat it. Um, there's a lot of intention that goes into cooking. And so I just feel like that's the manifestation of love in all five senses. Uh, and you can't get that from any other art form. Welcome to Nutrition Without Compromise, a podcast brought to you by Orlo Nutrition. We believe that nutrition shouldn't be an either or, that you should never have to sacrifice your morals for your health or that of our home planet. Join natural products veteran Karina Belizzi and experts from around the globe as they discuss healthy solutions that are better for you and better for the planet. Welcome to another interview episode of Nutrition Without Compromise. Today, we're going to further our conversation about health goal achievement. What does it really take to thrive and not just survive? How can you achieve your healthiest and fittest life? So today, I'm joined by Maria Ibrahim-Jones. She's also known as Chef Maria and the Fit Foodie. As a healthy food chef, holistic nutritionist, author, speaker, and entrepreneur, she constantly seeks to inspire people like you and me on our health journeys. She is the founder and inventor of the patented Eat Cleaner line. Now, this is now owned by Joe Mangano and Pitbull. She was featured on the Emmy-nominated cooking show, Recipe Rehab, for three seasons and has been seen on the Food Network and over 200 TV segments. Her latest book is called Eat Like You Give a Fork, The Real Dish on Eating to Thrive. She shares her wealth of knowledge through her podcast, which is called Recipes for Your Best Life, and also through social media platforms. You can follow her at Chef Maria. Maria is a mom of five and makes Southern California her home with her husband, Gabe, and their rescue lab, Garbanzo. Chef Maria, thank you so much for joining me and welcome to the show. So nice to be here with you, Corinna. I wanted to start today's conversation with what can sound like a simple question, but often isn't. And that is simply, what inspires you? Oh, so many things. Um, You know, and I think this is really the first step for a lot of people to pursue a health journey is what's your why? Um, My why is my family uh, being healthy and vibrant for them. Um, I have five children, two of my own and three with my, uh, my husband as my stepkids. And I just need to show up for them every day um, and to be in, in my best shape to serve my purpose on this planet. And uh, I think that's, that's my biggest motivator. Yeah, I think I second that myself. I have two young boys and being able to pick them up and throw them around even as they're now six and nine is yeah. one of my motivators for starting to lift heavy weight again. And, yeah. um, you know, that helps. I never feel like I'm throwing my back out when I play with them, which is, I think oh, yeah. it's needed. And, and, right? and you know what, they will appreciate it. What, what we now know is so much about exercise physiology and the impact of nutrition on both your physical and mental well-being. And when you show up for them in your best shape, you not only are present for them, but you inspire them and monkey see, monkey do, as they say, you know, they see what you see, uh, Mm -hmm. what you do, and they will imitate. And that's good or bad behavior. Yeah. And I will say that one of my proudest moments as a mom is the fact that I'm making healthy meals for my kids. And sometimes they're like, wow, mom, this is really good. And even when I'm incorporating herbs and spices and things that they might not otherwise be exposed to outside of our house, just making sure that I keep the culinary system in our home, something that's always the same, or isn't always kind of that kid food focused. 
So I personally have followed that. I'm sure as a chef, you'd probably advise something along the same lines. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing that you're doing that. And I think cooking is a survival skill. <laughs> you know, there, there's only a few things that we need to survive as human beings and food is one of them. And I know for me, I mean, since my kids were able to just stand on their two feet, I'd prop them up on a little stool in the kitchen or sit them up on the counter and just even having them press a button, you know, statistics show that when kids are involved, they're up to 80 to 85% more likely to try something. So a lot of the, the phobias around different foods can really be, you know, kind of diminished if we get them involved. And, you know, I felt pretty good about sending my daughter off to, to college. I, I knew she could fend for herself and, you know, not be burdened by having to go out to eat all the time or, you know, what they call the freshman 15. Um, and I think that's really, you know, one of the most important things that we can teach our kids from a young age. Yeah, absolutely. And with the freshman 15, for anyone who doesn't automatically know what this means, you mean the 15 pounds they gain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, here's the thing. I think for people to be good eaters means you have to know what's going on to your plate, right? I mean, it's, it's so easy in our day of convenience to just have food ordered, you know, and delivered to your to your uh, doorstep or go out to eat. But when you are involved in the process, you are intrinsically um, invested. You know what I mean? You're invested yeah. in the in the quality of the ingredients, the the smell, the the taste, the preparation, and I think you end up having much more gratitude for your food. And that gratitude that you have not only is absorbed by your body, it's also conveyed to the people that eat it. Um, there's a lot of intention that goes into cooking. And so I just feel like that's the manifestation of love in all five senses. Uh, and you can't get that from any other art form, you know? Yeah. And one of the things I often advise my friends to do and that I use as a practice myself is just bringing the kids with me to do grocery shopping or going to the farmer's market periodically yeah. and asking them to choose something that they want us to cook together. And so one good. of these, yeah. And one of these adventures led to me having to look something up because I really didn't know what to do with it. And that was the time that my son picked up a Buddha's hand. Oh, um, yeah. And I, you know, I've cooked with citrus, sure, but I just never actually bought a Buddha's hand. And so I ended up making a kind of lemon chicken recipe with it, which was really delectable in the end. And ultimately, you have so much rind to work with when you're working with the food yeah. hand that there was Love a lot left there. over and we could then use it for other things as well. So I ended up kind of making it a salad topper and part of a sal as a salad dressing as well. But he loved that. And he was only four at the time. And mm. so getting that kind of creativity and inspiration into your home can be something that kind of livens the mood around the whole thing and makes it less of a chore. I, I, that's that's amazing that you're doing that. I, I commend you. Um, and I think it's it's something that can turn into a really fun, you know, outing for people when they don't let it overwhelm them. Because I know that sometimes I hear from, sometimes people are like, you know, it's really hard to shop with a three or four year old. But <laughs> if you get them involved, it kind of changes the mood. It changes the assignment, so to speak, where it's not like a chore, it's more of an adventure. And, um, you know, physiologically, we are imprinted by the age of five, our taste buds and our predisposition to like certain things. So if kids are, uh, you know, given an opportunity to develop, to develop their palates really um, kind of more comprehensively, then you're far less likely to have issues later on in life with obesity, with, um, you know, challenging uh, cravings, with, um, you know, just kind of settling for what I would call like processed food, you know, kind of the, the typical children's menu where you get to pick from a hamburger or a hot dog or, or chicken nuggets, you know, their palates are much more robust and um, tend to they tend to be healthier people. So um, by the age of five, you're kind of you're kind of set in your ways, and you have to really condition, recondition your taste buds if you want to break out of those 
um, kind of, you know, that conditioning. So it's great to be able to explore all those flavors. And if you think about it, look around the world, so many cultures are giving their children a variety of flavors at a young age. I mean, if you go to China or Japan, you know, people are used to eating seafood and rice and vegetables for breakfast where the the sad diet or the standard American diet is all about sugar. Um, so it, it's not because they're genetically, you know, predisposed to like fish. It's just it's conditioning and it's exposure. So I think we can we can challenge them and we can have fun with it like you're doing. Yeah. And, you know, you can have non-traditional foods for breakfast. In France, as a for instance, an omelet is a summer. That's a supper. That's something you eat after, at dinner, not during breakfast, too. You know. Yeah, and, and in Egypt, where I grew up, it's very traditional to eat fava beans for breakfast. Mm -hmm. They're stewed fava beans, very umami, very rich in essential amino acids, purely plant-based protein because. A lot of people can't afford, quite frankly, meat and, and um, you know, eggs and things like that. So that's a very common breakfast served with pita bread. And, you know, it's supercharged with nutrition. I, I literally survived on fava beans growing up. Uh, and, and that is something that everybody eats. So, you know, we can not only explore different flavors, but I think look to the world as an influence for um, models of health. And I think the Mediterranean diet teaches us, uh, teaches us a lot about health and well-being. 100%. Mm. Now, as we deepen this conversation about foods and healthy eating, I would love to know what your favorite foods are that can also really benefit you, that can, can be health fixes, so to speak. Oh man, wow, so many different things. And you know, I never used to look at food quite like this until my 20s when I started in the natural foods world, um, which is where I kind of cut my teeth and, uh, you know, in exploring how food can affect our mood, how it can um, help us thrive versus just survive. And I think if I were to categorize them into different um, buckets, I, I'll start with antioxidants because, you know, oxidation is something that happens uh, every day from uh, disease. We have the highest number of chronic diseases now um, attributed to uh, oxidative stress. And so if we can add and focus on antioxidants in our daily existence, we can help to prolong cells, um, cell longevity at the mitochondrial level, and that helps us age better. I think in my 50s now, I'm, I'm definitely thinking about aging better. You know, this is like <laughs> my ultimate objective is to have energy and vitality well into my hundreds. Um, but so antioxidants showing up in the form of plant-based foods. I love berries. Berries are a superfood. One of the best things that you can enjoy. Um, blueberries, the, maybe the easiest and most affordable of all of them. Uh, easy to enjoy. Something that I eat every single week, um, if not every single day. Uh, also leafy greens. Leafy greens are the most nutrient dense foods on the planet, full of antioxidants, fiber, phytochemicals, um, micronutrients, you know, all of the good stuff. And I think um, for many people, you know, I think getting food into their bodies that is fuel that is good for them doesn't, it, it seems daunting, but it, it shouldn't have to be, you know, it can be as simple as adding some blueberries onto your oatmeal in the morning with some chia and flaxseed. You know, it can be as simple as throwing a handful of arugula onto your avocado toast. You know, mm -hmm. these are ways that we can upgrade our plate easily and get the antioxidant rich foods that we need every day. Um, I'm also on a big, big kick around seeds. You know, seeds are one of the best foods that you can add and everybody can do it, whether you're plant-based or an omnivore. And seeds are so full of omega-3 fatty acids, right? We know obviously the importance of omega-3s in feeding your brain. Your brain is 60% fat. It needs good fat in order to think properly so that you do all the other things that you're supposed to be doing and enjoying, right? 
So um, I just came back from a visit to Egypt where I'm from and a big antioxidant slash superfood is black cumin seed. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just referred to as black seed. Uh, people enjoy the oil. They eat the seeds whole. In Arabic, it's called habit al-baraka, which means a, a blessing. So it's the seed of blessing. And it truly is because there's so much science um, that proves that it's incredible for diabetes, um, regulating blood sugar. It has shown to help shrink cancer tumors. It helps with satiety. I, so many benefits. And so I'm really exploring the benefit of seeds and how we can very easily incorporate them into our everyday eating plan. Um, so antioxidants are a big thing along with omega-3s that I'm, I'm really focused on. And of course, protein. I mean, protein is the building block. It contains amino acids, the building blocks of humanity. It's what we need to power our muscles, um, prevent atrophy, and, and really age better. Um, so getting good quality protein is um, just absolutely a priority. I did my first uh, bodybuilding competition a couple of years ago. And so protein's really been hammered into my head, but getting mm -hmm. good quality protein in a lot of different varieties um, is really key. And something that I think as women, we tend to forget the importance of it because we naturally crave carbohydrates. So we have to kind of recondition ourselves to do that. Well, I want to stop here for a moment and deepen the discussion about two things that you've mentioned. One is omega-3s and the other connects to that because I think we're, we need to have a conversation about getting macros right. And uh, I would like to dive in more deeply. But while we pause on omega-3, since this is like my wheelhouse more than yeah. probably any other professional area I play, having worked in the space of health as it relates to omega-3s for over 20 years now, the, the challenge I see in so many individuals is even if they are getting the plant-based sources, they aren't getting enough EPA and DHA. Mm. And so for a long, long time, it was you know not that big of a deal in our minds. Okay, you can take some flax oil and you're going to get the benefits of the omega-3. Well, it turns out that you need to consume something like 16 times more of a bulk of flax seeds in order to even get close to what you might get from EPA and DHA in that um, your body has to go through these conversion pathways. And unfortunately, most people either lack enough of the enzymes to break it down, mm -hmm. or they're consuming so much omega-6, which actually competes for the same enzymes to break down, yeah. that they don't actually get to the EPA and DHA that their bodies require to function optimally. You mentioned your brain and eyes, for example, being 60% fat, which is absolutely true. Well, half of that fat is arachidonic acid, which is an omega-6. And the other half of that fat is DHA. Mm -hmm. And so getting a direct source of DHA and EPA every single day is critical. You know, with Orlo Nutrition, we provide that in our omega-3 and also our DHA formulas. Yeah. And they're in this more bioavailable polar lipid form so they can get right into your cells and get to work. Look, um, I have it literally, and I'm not even joking. It sits on my desk. Okay. I love that. This is not just a plug for Orlo. I'm, I'm no. dead serious. Since I started taking this supplement, I have to say that the me just mental clarity in and of mm. itself, indispensable. Um, and by the way, everybody in my family got sick, even though I mm. told them to take it, uh, on our trip and coming back from our trip, I'm the only one that didn't. Mm -hmm. So... I'm just saying, well, keep it going, uh, you know, it, it's just such a critical thing for people to understand and to do regularly. And I love that Orlo makes it in just an easy to take format that doesn't give you any sort of like ugly fish burps or anything yeah. like that. Um, really and vegan, I see, so. I see no, it. Right. I, yeah, I see it. And I saw the effect pretty immediately within, I would say, two weeks of taking it. Yeah. And that's also what we hear reported from our customer base, because unlike fish oil, um, it takes just longer for those to take effect. So, you know, they say, okay, you need to be taking an omega-3 fish oil for, you know, months before you often kind of see the benefit. We had an individual gave us a testimonial that they'd taken fish oil many times before, but never saw the dry eye complaints disappear until they started our product. Mm. And I, you know, within days as opposed to weeks of waiting too. So there's a benefit to the absorption rate being as great as it is. People get the benefit quicker. 
and they can therefore feel the connection like, oh, this is a change I made. Here's the benefit I'm seeing. And so they're more likely to keep the habit going. The other thing I wanted to say with regard to the omegas is this connection to oxidation and the connection between oxidation and inflammation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you're, when you're consuming nutrients that are, you know, in an oxidized format, like many of the cooking oils that are sitting there on the shelf for a long time, yeah. half the time you get them into your cabinet, you may or may not bake or cook with them often enough. So they sit in your cabinet and they essentially go bad. They spoil. And oxidized lipids are actually very damaging to the cells in your body because your body's really good at absorbing fats and sugars. Like we're yeah. great at that, right? We're so good at it. So if you are consuming an oxidized lipid, usually you can smell it, you know, like it's a little off and you may yeah. not know exactly why. Same thing with nuts or seeds that have just been yes. stored for far too long. Mm -hmm. However, if you can just take that oil and you rub it between your fingers like this, and um, if it's not super fluid, if it gets sticky, or if when you go like this, it feels like it's literally almost like glue holding your fingers together when you try to separate them, then that is an indication that the lipid is oxidized and you should just throw it away. So this is just like a healthy eating one-on-one -on -one thing you can do. Yeah. And if you get your oxidation right, like you're getting enough antioxidants, eating tons of berries, getting your omegas right, so you're not getting too much inflammation in your body, then these two things work together to create a system of health for you. Um, I wanted to ask a question that related to this. And now it's like, it's ferreted away from my brain suddenly. Oh, I well, let me, let, me, let me say something and maybe it will boomerang yeah. back, just yeah. kind of piggybacking on what you're saying. You know, I think for a lot of people, this is where they feel very intimidated, right? They feel like they're trying to get the balance of macronutrients down. Um, and I think, you know, I would just say and encourage everybody that's listening, it, it's not necessarily about perfection here. We understand that, you know, everybody's got challenges day to day. People are traveling, they're dealing with, you know, crises. There's so many inputs that can affect that. But I do think that coming up with, um, you know, routines and ultimately rituals that help you do things regularly, as regularly as possible, is a big step towards better health. And so I just encourage people to start with a good morning ritual. Um, and that morning ritual can be, you know, ha start with you know, um, a nice glass of water. I like to add magnesium to my water, you know, <laughs> get your, get your magnesium going in the morning. So important. You know, I just read a statistic that over 70% of people over 70 are significantly magnesium deficient and it can cause so many problems, heart, um, palpitations and dizziness and, um, feeling of vertigo. I think my dad has it actually, because I was talking to him about it. But anyway, get in the habit of doing things in the morning, um, get a good uh, breakfast in, take your supplements, have them sitting right where, you know, you go do your work or where you brush your teeth, um, have that moment of gratitude to kind of absorb it all. Like these are the routines that turn into rituals that we can then try and keep regularly so that even if we're not perfect on a day, at least we're doing the things that help to keep us on track. Yeah. Um, and, and that should give us all a, a feeling like, okay, I may not have it perfect, but I'm on the right track. So you brought us right back to macros, which I had mentioned, and this is part of what I wanted to know. Yeah. Um, I personally do best when I'm on about 40% of my calories from carbohydrates 30% from fat and 30% from protein. That's yep. when I feel the most sated, like I'm not hungry all the time. Yep. And also when I seem to be able to manage my weight better. Mm -hmm. I was really bad at this for a while because I just got into the habit of eating what I was making at the moment and I wasn't keeping very good track of my nutrition totally. Mm -hmm. So I made this commitment to myself at the end of last year. I bought myself a smartwatch so I could track things on the go more, like whether or not I had my phone on me. Yeah. And I'm using the apps there to track my consumption. And because it has like every food, even most brands and restaurants like macros yeah. built in, yeah. I can log my food on the way. And what I'm finding is that 
Well, for one, I've lost 11 and a half pounds, which is great. Awesome. That's huge. And without losing any muscle mass, I've actually put on about 0.4 pounds of muscle. That's great. So I, that's like something that's especially challenging for women in their forties. I'm 47 yep. and um, I can see the horizon bringing me back to my prior level of fitness. I've been a yep. marathoner. I've lifted weight for a long time. I'm back in the gym in a way that I'm happy with uh, almost every day. And it just feels really good. I feel better in my skin. I yeah. feel more energetic. And I really hadn't noticed that I was flagging a little bit in that way until I changed everything up. Yeah. Um, and, and listen, I think this is very personal. You know, it's important that we really talk about this because there are a lot of, you know, influencers, trainers, nutritionists telling you, even doctors telling you that you should eat this much, this much, and this much protein, mm -hmm. carbs, and fat. And the truth is everybody is different. Your age matters, your sex matters, your activity and the type of activity matters. Look, a marathon runner versus a bodybuilder are going to have very different protein needs, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, you know, you have to think about genetic predisposition. So, um, I am in the process of getting my brain health coach certification through the Amen University. And Dr. Daniel Amen mm -hmm. talks about, you know, different types of brains and how these brains crave differently. So it even forget about blood type, like your brain type can actually dictate how you, uh, you know, your propensity to needing more carbohydrates, for example, versus uh, protein. And people who don't quite get it right can honestly be really miserable in their lives. Um, so if you're a person that just naturally, you know, needs to have more carbohydrates and actually responds better, I have a very good friend who she's, you know, 5'11 and she needs a lot more carbohydrates than I do. I don't do well on a high carb diet. I do mm -hmm. much better with more protein and more vegetables. I mean, there's still carbohydrates, but in terms of like grains it's and things a different like kind. That, yeah, yeah, that's just like that needs to be more of my like supplement. And then I do well with fat. So, mm -hmm. you know, and more plant based fat. I don't do well with um, animal fat at all. Like it really bogs me down. I don't do, I can't eat dairy. Uh, so, so things like that, like you, you begin to know yourself. And I think what you're doing with keeping a food log, the mm -hmm. number one thing that I will tell anybody that is on a health journey is start to keep track of your food. You can start with like, I have a, a 10 day meal plan that I give people to kind of identify like, what is your best type or your best split, uh, macro split. And it's, it's to get them started to see like, how are they responding? And I have them write down every single day, like, how are you feeling? How do you mm -hmm. feel in your body? Not just, don't, don't tell me about just the scale. I wanna know how you feel. Um, are you energetic? Are you happy? Tell me about your mood. Like, do you feel like you're crashing in the afternoon? So then we can take a closer look and see how you're responding to your different macronutrient, um, to your split. And when I say split, just like you were saying, maybe it's 40% protein instead of carbohydrate. Maybe it's yep. you know 20 or 25% fat. Maybe, you know, we just need to kind of massage that based on all of those factors and your goals. When I was getting ready for my competition, you know, your macro split looks very, very different. And again, it all boils down to what your goals are. So right. I, I would take anything that somebody says generally with an extra grain of salt um, because there is no one size fits all. Everyone is different. A woman in menopause is going to eat very, very differently than a guy in his 30s. Like we just, we can't do a one size fits all. That's kind of ridiculous. Right. And I totally agree with you. I mean, people will follow a fad diet and say suddenly, okay, well, this is the only way to go. And that simply doesn't work. I, I will give an example from my personal experience. I decided to try the Whole30 diet. And the way the Whole30 diet is constructed, you could make almost every diet kind of work with it, you know? 
But yeah. I, at the time, was eating meat still, and I was choosing to make bacon for my husband because that's what he wanted. And then I was actually making a frittata in the bacon grease. And like you, I don't do super well with that much animal fat. And so what happened is I started to feel like really constricted in my joints. It actually mm. hurt to do this, like to curl my fingers like claws almost. I would feel yeah. pain in my knuckles or in my toes. And so that was an indication to me that I was getting just too much inflammatory fat. Arachidonic acid, which is present in most animal fats, is more inflammatory in the body. I needed more omega-3. And oh. as I learned more about my genetics, I also learned about why. And that is that I have one representation of APOE4, which also means I have a harder time assimilating some of the omega-3 or anti-inflammatory fats. Therefore, having them in that polar lipid form is even better, right? So it's yeah. funny that like what I've learned about my physiology, my personal physiology, and also the experience of trying many different diet plans over the years to find what works for me. Now, as a marathoner, to your point, I got yep. more like 50% of my calories from carbohydrates and sometimes even more. Um, mm -hmm. And really that depended on how hard I was training, how many miles I was putting on my feet. And often, you know, things like the goos you eat on the super long runs, which are just pure sugars to keep you going, you know, no, no. Your muscles need those stores. The, it, the, and that, you know, I think what we have, I think, access to maybe more than ever is our personal physiological needs. You know, a blood test can tell us quite a bit, but there are certain markers that we even need to dive into a little bit further if we don't want to do this trial and error with different types of splits. But I'll tell you, you know, it's really misleading because people can have very good results on certain diets, but then things go sideways. I'll give you an example. So there's a big, big push towards the carnivore diet. I lose mm -hmm. my mind. I'm just going to say it. I lose my mind when I see Thank people you, Dr. Paul Saladino, right? Sticks of butter. I just want to like... I just want to cry. Yeah. And Dr. Saladino, like attacking kale, like it's, you know, the antichrist. I mean, really, what has kale done to you? Um, the plant doesn't but, want you to eat it, I think is what he would say. Right? Yeah, that's more than that. He's on a, a mission to destroy it. But, you know, so I have a friend that, you know, has been on the carnivore diet for a couple of years now. And for a couple of years, I've been telling him it's not a good idea. Okay. It might be a quick fix to help you drop body fat if you're responding to that or to help with satiety, but mm -hmm. it's not something you want to do for the long haul. It will clog your arteries. There, there's no way that not, he, he was like, I flat out don't eat vegetables. I'm like, I don't know how you're going to the bathroom every day. Like literally not getting any fiber. I'm glad you brought that up because that's the thing that I notice when I get my protein up to about 50% of my calories. And I was of this mind for a while that I was like, well, you know, more protein at this stage in my life might actually be better as I'm trying to build more muscle mass. But I found that it was harder to go to the bathroom. And I just couldn't really stomach it, so to speak. I just had to get more vegetables. I had to get more, um, basically just a more balanced diet. And it sounds yeah, perhaps too simple, but it just wasn't balanced enough. I was too overweighted on the proteins without getting enough fiber and without getting enough, enough other nutrients to, to really have a comfortable movement every morning the way I was before. Yeah. I mean, that, and that's a very personal thing. And hydration, you know, you get so much hydration from eating fruits and vegetables that help with that. But, you know, I, my friend, here we are a couple years later, and he started having heart issues. And mm -hmm. it looks like he's going to have to have a stint now. And I just, it breaks my heart, to be honest, because so many people are out there and they're doing exactly what they're seeing on social media. They are being influenced to do things that absolutely makes no sense. We are not cavemen anymore. You know, we are living in the modern world. We're very, many of us are sedentary for the most part. Like we're just, it's, it's not the same world. So I just, I'm saying this with a lot of voracity because it drives me crazy that so many people will follow something 
simply because they're seeing an immediate result. Therefore, they think that's the answer for the long haul. And it's very dangerous and it's a very slippery slope. So really think about those decisions before you jump on board. Another comment that I wanted to make about your discussion around seeds. Um, This also stems to Paul Saladino because he will villainize seed oils all day long, say that they're like the culprit of all of our health problems. And I think what he really means to say is fried foods and foods that are overprocessed. Sure. Um, we just, we need to make it a little bit more clear for people. I don't say go to corn oil or safflower oil to make all your food. That's not what I would ever advocate. Right. But there are, you know, the seeds should not be thrown out with that bath water. And getting some, I have sesame seeds, chia seeds, and um Gosh, I use pumpkin seeds and things like that that I'll throw into salad dressings Mm -hmm. or I'll even throw them in the blender with my protein shake to get the benefits of the seeds at the time I'm having the protein shake. There's another good reason behind this. If you are doing a protein shake, a lot of the times they don't have any fat in them. It's like protein and some fruit or something to that effect. And if you're taking fat soluble vitamins, you'll get more out of them if you're consuming them with a little bit of fat. So even just consider throwing a couple walnuts in that protein shake and you'll do better. Sure. Yeah. Seeds. I mean, avocado at that too. You know, Mm -hmm. seeds are just so, and like I mentioned before, I'm really hot on this topic right now because I have noticed in myself, like you were talking about your hands and um, feeling some tightness my hands, I, it used to hurt in the morning when I woke up to just make a fist. Now I'm right. fine. Um, I recovered from a torn ACL and never had surgery. And I truly believe that's attributed to the nutrition that I'm doing, plus the addition of seed oil. So I think you're right. I think we're really missing um, and throwing the baby out with a bathwater, so to speak, if we just completely dismiss this category. Um, and I'll tell you another thing that's really I've really benefited from that is documented from taking black seed oil is skin and hair health. Mm. My hair has never been this thick. I'm not getting grays. I'm 55. Mm. I barely have any gray hair. Um, and I, you know, my skin is more vibrant and healthy looking than ever. Like th- these are the secrets of our ancestors. This is what ancient wisdom has been telling us for thousands of years. They've used seed oils. So I just, I believe in ancient wisdom. I believe that um, there were much smarter people that came before us that did things that worked. Why reinvent Mm. it? You know, and there's wisdom in plants. Um, The fact that you've rediscovered this piece, I've seen the science on black seed oil. There's actually um, science regarding the combination too of black seed oil with omega Mm threes. And what we'll see, for instance, is that people have greater successes with weight loss journeys when they get these things in combination. That they see a reduction in inflammatory markers, and those are pretty well documented. It's so, one of the most documented of all the the botanical oils, mm-hmm. and you're you know you're um, you're bringing something up that I think we need to also keep in mind is I think people get caught up on this idea of like oh it's wrong to supplement that's why it's called a supplement. Well, <laughs> I, I think that's I think that's crazy because it's true though people do get caught up on that they they see the inflammatory media saying all these 50 supplements didn't work so then they don't consider any supplements as being good um the reality is there is a ton of crap out there like let's there be is. real there's some products that just probably you might as well throw them away right but there when is. they find and, a reputable source means, it's yeah. different that, that means that we need to find the right sources and take right, them in the exactly. accommodation. And, and when I really look back and I think about like what I have done in the past, I'm going to say probably three years since I started Perry, um, going into Perry after, you know, the pandemic. And then now kind of on the tail end of like going through menopause, taking this and taking the black cumin and taking a good probiotic have all made the biggest impact, those three things. So um, let's talk about probiotics. What is your favorite? I have mine, I can share too. (laughs) Yeah, you know, I think 
let, let's just talk about probiotics for a second, because when it comes to absorption and, and your gut health, you know, being able to utilize those nutrients and actually activate them so that they benefit your body so that they're absorbed, you know, depends on your gut health and your gut health also is, um, you know, your gut is the biggest producer of serotonin. So it's, if you want to build your mood and feel good, you got to get your gut right. Um, otherwise like these things that you're adding to your repertoire every day are really not going to show any benefit. So I really try and get whole food sources as much as possible, but I do take a supplement. Um, can I say the name? Go ahead. Yes. Okay. I've been taking the garden of life. Um, it's a hundred billion, uh, CFUs. It's a very diverse type of probiotic. I've been taking it for about 10 years now. Um, mm. but really more diligently over the last, like I said, few years, and it's helped to prevent me from getting sick. Um, it's helped to prevent me from getting bladder infections, which I used, used to get all the time when I was in my twenties. Um, and just in general immune response, I feel so much stronger than I ever have. I used to get sick all the time. Mm. So th it's really been a big help, but definitely supplementing, um, other things like eating yogurt. And, um, I, I do a lot of pickled foods, kimchi, sauerkraut. I drink raw apple cider vinegar regularly, um, and uh, yeah, all of those have made a big, big impact for me. Yeah. You know, you, and let's just sum up, I think for the audience too, because we've mentioned a few supplements that I think could be really helpful. Yeah. Um, we've talked about omega threes. We both love Orlo omega three, which yes. is, the show was brought to you by them. Um, we can give you an extra 10% off with the co coupon code NWC at checkout. And that can help you seal the deal, so to speak. We have black seed oil. There are several available on the marketplace. Um, you've mentioned black cumin. Yep. And oh, this same thing, black cumin and black seed, same, interchangeable. Okay, it's the same. I wasn't sure. I thought perhaps they were two different things, but it's black seed oil or black cumin. Yep. Okay. And then also have mentioned this digestive health product as well as um, adding a magnesium to your water. I've used calms to put into tea in the evening to help me relax into my night. Yep. I'll, I'll use that one in like a chamomile tea or a sleep tea of some sort. So and <laughs> yeah. And it's just, okay. So for women out there, especially if you're in perimenopause or if you're pregnant or going through other hormonal shifts, you'll often wake up in the middle of the night with like a cramp in your calf or something like that. That is foot. often... It's just not enough magnesium, right? Yeah. And magnesium so, and potassium together too. Exactly. So getting yeah. enough of that can be really, really critical. I actually love, and, and this is perhaps because I fell in love with this particular nutrient when I was training for marathons, but for exercise, before I go to the gym, I will drink a little bit of coffee and mm -hmm. throw some D-ribose in there to sweeten oh, it up. Okay. Yeah. And the reason for that is that D ribose is how your muscles use sugar. And so I find that my performance is stronger when I do that. And yeah. there's science that back both those things up a little bit of caffeine and some D ribose, and you'll feel stronger and you'll get more accomplished in that particular jaunt. And for me, it's a treat. So I like something that can be a treat. Yeah. <laughs> and you think about it, a lot of pre-workouts do that, but doing it the way you're describing helps to eliminate a lot of the chemicals and, and processed ingredients that end, end up like just the junk that goes into pre-workout. I would say electrolytes too are really helpful. And those trace minerals, by the way, talk going back to seeds and nuts too, mm -hmm incredible sources of trace minerals and magnesium pumpkin seeds one of the best sources of whole food magnesium so pumpkin seeds sunflower seeds all of those so um you know i i'm gonna i'm gonna go on the record and say seeds are your friend don't don't <laughs> dump those out um but again these different things that we're talking about i think you know also the 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 variability here in, in how much to take depends on where you're at in your life stage. You know, as we age, certain things just deplete um, and we need to add them in. We just don't produce them naturally. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's always good to check 
in with your doctor, check in with, um, you know, a registered dietitian or a nutritionist that can help guide you on what is right for you, depending on your goals. And that way you don't have to um, spend too much time trying to hit the mark, so to speak. But I think as a general guideline, these are the things that have helped my life. So I, I know that, you know, everybody is different, but um, there are professionals out there that can help you really hone the amount too. Yeah. So just as we round out the conversation today, we've talked a bit about round, we've talked a little bit about getting the macros right and how that can vary for you. Yeah. I've heard a lot in media of late saying that individuals need to get a lot more protein and perhaps more protein than is easy to get in a single meal or even three meals a day in order to achieve their health goals. Where do you sit on this particular issue? You know, uh, again, it, it really boils down to what your goals are. Um, I think as a general number, I like to see women get between 0.8 to 1 gram of protein a day for every, you know, for their desired body weight. So if your desired body weight is, you know, 150 pounds for it, just as a round number, 150 pounds, the goal is to get somewhere between 120 to 150 grams in a day. Now, that said, um, that's not for everybody. You know, that's for somebody that's building muscle, actively building muscle. Um, I was with somebody uh, over the weekend. I was a speaker at the Fit Expo and a bodybuilder was telling me that when he was at the peak of his training, um, they were getting four grams per uh, per pound of body weight. And I just thought to myself, that's kind of insane. That's a lot uh, of food to eat. This is those individuals too, that are setting an alarm to wake up in the middle of the night so they can eat some chicken because they need to get more in. About like big, 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 big muscles. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's just, uh, you know, the thought of that is very daunting even for most people to think about eating that much food. So I say that as, you know, somebody who is actively trying to build muscle and to keep muscle on, because as we get older, quite frankly, it becomes a lot harder to build muscle. So, um, you know, I'm going to, I, I say that for women that are in peri, um, post and, you know, kind of, uh, a little bit older to try and reach that. Now, if you're younger um, it, you may be very well off somewhere in the like 0.5 gram range. So if you're 150 pounds, maybe 75 grams. But again, it's all going to boil down to where you are in your life stage, what your fitness goals are on your health journey. And how do you feel? You know, at the end of the day, if you're able to retain muscle, I know people who are in their 30s that can retain muscle really, really well on half you know, quarter of a gram to half a gram of protein a day. So mm -hmm. that's just not me though. So it, it really boils down to an individual need. Yeah. And from my personal experience, I shared that I'm down 11 and a half pounds since Christmas when I got myself this for Christmas. Right. Um, but I also have put on 0.4 pounds of, of muscle and to get there, I am averaging between 95 and 105 grams of protein a day, but I've always been someone who puts on muscle fairly easily. So even mm. at 47, that doesn't seem to have faded that much. Yeah. Um, and it enables me to manage my health and feel good at that particular range. But I got to tell you, most of my friends who were in a similar situation, I would say, you know, you probably need that 150 grams of protein a day. Yeah, How I would get there. Let me, let me say when you think about your macronutrients, I think the one good thing that people can use macronutrient um, splits for is to really prioritize high quality food. Because mm -hmm. I think when you have that as your benchmark, if you actually are thinking about protein and prioritizing it, then there's less room for garbage. That's so definitely if, true. Yes. You know, if I'm starting my my day with good high quality protein, I'm I'm really setting the tone for the rest of the day. And rather than thinking like, oh, I'm going to eat that donut, you know, well, wait, have I gotten my protein in for the for the day for the meal? It's just how you, you think know? about it, it really does. Yeah. So it just changes how you perceive food. Mm -hmm. And I think 
that's the best way that we can use this idea of macros um, is if I'm if my goal is to get to a hundred and you know ten grams of protein to one hundred and twenty grams of protein a day, and I'm you know rounding the corner into dinner and I I haven't done that yet. I'm going to drink a protein shake, and you know what? I'm probably not going to want the junk. You know, mm-hmm. so just I think that's a really helpful way to look at it too. Is let let that fuel you to prioritize higher quality nutrition. You know, one of the bases where you can get a lot of junk in your food is actually a lot of the proteins that are out there. Like you can look at the laundry list of ingredients in them. So I just want to make bars are the worst. (laughs) Yeah, I know. So some of them are really bad. And so I just would like for people to understand that there are cleaner options available. And if you've had a protein shake before and you said, oh, I really didn't like it. Believe me, there's one out there that you will like. And so I'm personally at the point in my life and having tried enough of them uh, where I I just get the unflavored, unsweetened proteins. I have plant-based versions and also whey-based versions that I, I get, and I mix it up from time to time. But I'm putting real fruits into my smoothies, and if I want a little more sweetness, I'll put some banana, and I can put nuts and seeds and greens, and, and you know, I'll even throw a greens powder in there or a matcha powder and it changes the flavor profile of the thing I'm consuming. So I keep it fresh. And yeah. so you really can create something that will work for you. And this is one of the only ways that I'm able to make sure I hit a hundred grams or more of protein a day is by having a protein shake with about 25 to 30 grams of protein in it at one of my snacks. It just makes it easier to get there, especially since I'm mostly plant-based in my meals and I don't eat animal products before dinner. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, got to the point where I, you know, had to really watch certain macros in my training and I would simply just put a scoop of protein powder into my shaker cup with some water and drink it. Like there are good quality proteins out there that should still taste good. And I would encourage people, you know, if you love a smoothie and that's something that you get into your day every day, boy, load it up. That's where you can really get a lot of your um, added micronutrients and phytonutrients. Let's not forget, we were talking about macros, but those micronutrients are also incredibly valuable and where you can get a lot of these additional uh, vitamins and minerals that we're talking about. So trying to get them from whole food sources as much as you can. Uh, A smoothie is a great way to do that. I'm a big fan of adding my greens and, and, you know, my berries and getting uh, the flax and the the chia and all of that in all in one fell swoop. It, it's a great way to do it. Yeah. And I will admit that I've sometimes used a chocolate protein shake that is flavored, that's fairly clean with my coffee to make a mocha and had it hot. Oh, and yeah. People don't think about that. Or they can Ooh. take a collagen and do some of the same thing because you get collagen proteins and all those peptides, which is also beneficial to health. So there, there's just a way to get there. If you have a goal and you know you want 150 grams of protein a day, you can do it. It may just take a little bit of creativity to get there, whether you're plant based. I agree. And I, I, think, I think, again, setting yourself up for success means having the right stuff at your disposal in your kitchen every single week, you know, so I encourage people to create those rituals and habits where, you know, okay, I've got my supplements that I need and I take them at a certain time, you know, I've got my protein powder and, you know, at this time is when I'm taking it, or I have my collagen and I'm going to mix that into my coffee or my tea, you know, having those rituals that you do every single day, really helps to fill in the gaps. And uh, I I believe that that's been the the biggest change, I think, from, let me say, my 20s and my 30s, where I just felt like I was chasing my tail. (laughs) Uh, And I think we have a lot more science and and understanding of nutrition now than ever um, that's available to people, you know, and not just health professionals. But I think the more we can you know, make it easy on ourselves with these habits and rituals, the better. 100%. 
Well, I realize we're coming up to our hour point here. So I really just want to thank you for your time. I really encourage people to check out your podcast. I was so enjoying the episode that you released in the last week on episode number 117, which was called Unbreakable Strength, How Muscle Saves This Trainer's Life. Yes, I think there's so much wisdom in that particular episode, and it really helps people understand how you can go from worst case scenario back to your best health. Um, I mean, I just, I just think you, that was an incredibly insightful and inspirational story in that particular episode. I encourage people to go check it out. And I think they'll be happy to continue following you and your journey on social platforms as well. So you're at chef Mariah, that's um, C H E F M A R E Y. Right. E Y A. Yeah. E Y A. That's correct. I, I lost the last letter there. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I welcome people to come and um, check it out, ask questions. Also on my website at chefmaria.com, there's a lot of free resources for people. There are, um, you know, recipe booklet downloads, and I have a free masterclass on fit and fab over 40, um, you know, how our hormones change and what we can do to embrace our best fit life at at you know, 40 and beyond, because I think um, people feel like it's downhill from there. And I'm just saying life's just getting started. So I welcome people to check out those resources. And I'm here to help uh, however I can. Yeah, I joke with my kids that my my death age keeps increasing. I, I'm always saying it's 60 years from my present age. So now I'm saying I'll live to be 107. <laughs> So I'm you know, just not willing to give up. And that's, and that's like, I think we need to just keep encouraging people to live their best quality of life right now. You know, yeah. it's, it's quality of life is so, so incredibly important. I, and what I want to encourage people is to feel like they are living their best lives without feeling like they're sacrificing too much. They're not able to enjoy the things they love. There's always an opportunity to enjoy the little things, you know, it's just a matter yeah. of, um, you know, not being too, too hard on yourself and knowing that every day is an opportunity for improvement. Well, that's a perfect note on which to end. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Critton. As always, I will be sure to include links to everywhere Chef Maria is active, including her website and where you can find her in social channels. I'll be sure too to point you to that podcast because that particular episode I think could be a real inspiration for all of you. Now, if you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you're picking this up. If it's on YouTube, leave us a comment. Now, each of these actions helps more people to discover the show so we can all reach our best health naturally. As we close today's show, I hope that you'll raise a cup of your favorite beverage with me as I say my closing words. Here's to your health. Thanks for listening to Nutrition Without Compromise. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to learn more, visit orlonutrition.com and join our mailing list. You'll gain access to complete show notes, features, and informative blogs because nutrition shouldn't be an either or.